Um, so how is it that uh, families can achieve great outcomes now that lead to even more in the future? Uh, to answer this, I'd like to welcome Sam Payer. She's director of the Growing Space and winner of the uh, 2021 Impact 25 Awards for contributions to positive social, uh, social change. Uh, Sam will share some insights from over 20 years of supporting people with disability and as a parent of two young adults with a disability. Thanks, Sam. Thanks so much, Mello. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for having me. And I'd also like to share an acknowledgement, although I don't think I could possibly top that one by the preschoolers, um, but I do acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the land in which we're all meeting today. And I pay my respects uh, to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. Um, sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So thank you. Um, I'm just gonna start off by sharing my little screen, if that's okay. Can we do that? Is that working? Yes, excellent, great. Um, and you know what? I think I'm gonna kind of get stuck straight into this. Uh, my, some of you may know me already. Uh, I run a small business. Um, I'm on the Independent Advisory Council for the NDIA, and I have two sons with disability. One is 21 and has Down syndrome, and my 19-year-old son uh, was born very early and has some hangover disability from that. So let me, um, I thought about what I wanted to do today and I thought lots of different ways of doing this and I ended up deciding that I was going to write myself a list of the things that I wish I knew when my kids were little um, and things that I've learned since. And you know what, I guess some of this might change again in another 20 years, but this is certainly where I am now. So I'm going to get stuck into that. Bear with me. There we go. Um, the first thing that I think is super important for, um, for families is to always have very high expectations. High expectations of the life that your child will leave, live high expectations of the life you will live as a family. Um, when, uh, when my little guy was, uh, uh, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to go back even further. I was pregnant with him um, and I was bleeding. And I went to the doctor and the doctor said, uh, this is not compatible life, we're going to clean it up. And I said, you know what, I'm just gonna um, let that sit. Let's let nature take its course and see what happens here. Um, I now have a strapping 19 year old young man with a full beard and at university. Um, so there was my first one where I had high expectations. I thought, you know what, I'm not, um, I'm not going with that right now. The next one was when my waters broke very early at 24 weeks. And I was told that when he was delivered, that they were going to deliver him that night and that when he was delivered, I would have to make a decision and would probably need to turn off his life support. Once again, I made a higher expectation and I said, you know what? No, 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 I'm just going to assume that he's okay and that he's going to live and I'm going to go through and, and live our life in that way. And now I have a strapping 19 year old son with a full beard at university. Then I was told when he was born and in the hospital, that uh, which was two months later, by the way, we managed to hold on for two months, um, that he would have severe disability and um, that he would not walk, that he would not talk, um, that he would not be able to function in our society um, and that I should sign a do not uh, do not resuscitate because he was having lots of life threatening events. Um, and at that point, I thought, no, 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 I'm going to have high expectations. He's going to come through. He'll be fine. However, that looks, he's going to be who he was meant to be. Um, so I actually went with it. Uh, and now I have a strapping 19 year old young man with a full beard going to uni and working as a support worker, would you believe it? So there was the first examples of having higher expectations. Before I had him though, I had my young son, Ben. Ben was born with Down syndrome and I was told that he would probably not be able to speak very much. I spoke to um, a therapist at the hospital who told me that I would probably never be able to have a really meaningful conversation with him. Well, here he is in grade seven at the age of 13 years old, giving a speech at a very large conference with 200 people. Did he speak super clearly and everyone understood every word? No, 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 no. But that has come with time and he's pretty good now. Um, but there he was, my confident young man standing up in front of everyone. I had to expect that he could live a full and proper life, which is exactly what he is doing. 
I was also told when he was in kindergarten that he would not be good enough for the speech and language program, which was a disability program at the school, that his speech would not be, was not good enough for him to do that. But um, I had higher expectations and I insisted that he went there. And I'm very glad he did because there were lots of role models there and lots of people speaking. Ben was born in the year 2000. He was born in February, just before or just around the Sydney Olympics. I was um, fairly isolated, living overseas. Um, and I, it's funny, I can't even imagine why I thought this at the time. This is pretty funny, just bear with me, folks. But I remember thinking when he was born and I was told that he had Down syndrome, I was devastated that there was no potential for him to be an Olympian. Now, no son of mine was ever going to have the potential to be an Olympian. Let me get that straight. We are not sporty people. Um, so I'm not quite sure why that stuck in my little head, but there you go. Um, but here is a photo of Ben two years ago at the World Athletics Games for INAS, representing Australia, chosen to represent Australia. Uh, my, no one else in our family has ever represented Australia at anything. Um, and there is my son, and he's um, soon to be awarded what's called the Australian Sports Medallion, which is only awarded to Olympians and those that have represented Australia at very high levels in, um, in various sports. So, okay, high expectations. I did not have that expectation, um, but if I had had much lower expectations, there's no way on earth he ever would have met, um, would have ended up competing for Australia. My next one that I wanted to talk about was about trusting yourself when you're working with professionals. Um, we've already heard a, a few of those stories. Your son will never live. Let's clean it up now. Uh, he will never walk and talk. Um, you'll have to make decisions about life support and switch him off. Well, yeah, I think you've really got to look at your own gut as a parent and you know what's best for your family. We do take in advice. You're listening to me right now. Maybe you'll take in some of this. Maybe there'll be one gem that comes out of today for you. I don't know. Hopefully. Um, but I think it's super important to trust your gut. I remember um, one of the failures, and there are many failures uh, in my part as a parent, was when Ben was little um, and I had some money for some respite, for some support for him. Um, and I asked the team, this was overseas, so the system was a little bit different. I asked whether I could use that funding to hire somebody else, an adult with Down syndrome, to work as a parent helper in my home. And they all said, oh, no, you don't want to do that. That won't work. No, they, they won't have that sort of capacity to do that. And that really bothers me now. When I look back on it, I wish someone had helped me stand up for that back then because I now look at many young adults with disability and with Down syndrome. And I think, gosh, they would make perfect parent helpers, absolutely brilliant parent helpers. And in fact, there are a few in our community that are working in childcare centers. So that's advice that I wish I'd heard way back then. And on the flip side, we do hear advice that is good as well. One, uh, one professional sat me down once, we were having an awful, awful time with a particular teacher. And she was really quite horrible. She had terribly low expectations and she really didn't engage uh, Ben. And, you know, she thought of herself as babysitting. It was really quite horrible. Um, and I was really determined to fight. I was determined that she would be a better teacher. And this particular professional, a different professional from the disability community pulled me aside and said, Sam, don't sacrifice your own child for the greater good. So while there are lots and lots of teachable moments out there, um, be careful that you don't sacrifice your own family for those teachable moments. Fix your own oxygen mask first. You all would have heard that before. Um, here we go, inclusive education. We did choose inclusive education, but there were lots of barriers. Lots of barriers. When Ben was this age, here's a photo of him in his speech and language program. He was ready to go into primary school. Um, and the school system told us, don't go to a regular primary school, don't be included, he will never have any friends. And I'm very, very glad that I did not listen, although it was very hard not to listen at that point, very, very hard to make those decisions. Um, but if I were to advise myself now, I would say, go for it, do it, do it, do it, don't even hesitate, don't second guess yourself. Um, 
Another thing that I wish I had known, I wish, I wish I had not devoted so much time and energy sitting in therapists' rooms, working with my kids, um, with the therapist. Um, to be honest, we used to drive 45 minutes to an hour to get to many of our therapy appointments, both ways, because we lived in a regional area in the US. And every time I would go to the therapy, often I would actually fall asleep on the sofa while the therapist was working with my son, either of my sons. This is my younger son here. Now, I've read research that says that children with Down syndrome that do lots of physical therapy or physio walk six weeks earlier than those that don't on average. And I think, was it worth giving up three hours of our life every week, utter exhaustion, petrol, cost, uh, all of the things that go with that inability to work for me at the time in order for him to have potentially maybe have walked six weeks earlier? I'm not really confident about that. I'm really, really not confident about that. But moving on from that, even if he hadn't walked, I don't know. Ben was always going to be who he's going to be. And so was my youngest son. Um, I think back then I was going to therapy thinking that I was going to turn this elephant into a giraffe, that this slow lumbering thing was going to turn into this gazelle that was going to run through the fields and feed itself off the tallest branches and whatever else. That was a really, really weird perspective. I wish someone had told me about the social model of disability, um, about Therapy is good and it is useful and it is an important piece of our package. We want our kids to be their best selves, no doubt. But I don't think I, don't think I would have been so keen on changing my son to fit society uh, if I had known what I knew now. Because I think now I should be changing society to fit him. All right. More about not drowning in therapy. When you add up all the hours you spend in therapy, there's still an absolute fraction of, a of the time of your child's life. They're very, very small. When, you when your therapist comes and meets them at school for half an hour a week or an hour a fortnight or whatever it is, um, they're not really spending a lot of time actually doing with your child. Um, the best therapy is the therapy that happens in the home, with your family, at the playground, uh, at the family gathering, and on holidays. I can tell you, without a shadow of a doubt, that my kids learnt the most that they ever, ever learnt when we were actually on holidays, when we were away camping with other families, where other families would say, no, 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 just leave him, he'll be right. And then I would watch him be my, far more motivated to crawl across the dirt to be with the other kids in the mud pool, for example, whatever it was. All of these things were... Um, I think parents of typical kids see the same thing. When you go away on holidays, your kids come back bigger and taller and stronger and, and smarter and doing more with more independence. So I think we should probably think about applying that to therapy as well. Therapists make great consultants, but they're not the doers. The doers are families, are families and friends. That's a bit hard to hear sometimes when you're drowning and you're exhausted. Um, but even when you're drowning, drowning and exhausted, you're doing more for your children um, than a therapist is doing in an hour a week or two hours a week. No question. The next one, this is really, I, I, no one told me this. I wish I had known. And I've come to this very late, but I wish I had done this when they were littler. Um, I wish I had made friends with adults with disability when my kids were little. I have many, many very close friends with significant uh, disability, a range of disabilities now. And I learn more from them than I learn about from, from anyone else. And I also would have had role models for my children had I had friends with disability in my home way back then. So here is one of my dearest friends, Glenda. Glenda has a muscular dystrophy. She's been in a wheelchair for a very long time. She refers to herself as a crip elder. That's a bit of confronting language for you, but that's her choice to call herself that. Um, so Glenda and I have been friends for probably 10, 12 years now. And I'll never forget the day she told me this story. She was getting on the train and in Adelaide on the trains, the conductor has to come out and put a ramp onto the train. And the conductor was being a bit whingy and whiny. Oh, you know, it costs us so much money and time to do this. And she turned to this bloke 
And she said, yeah, imagine how much cheaper it would be for the government if we didn't have to put chairs in all the trains. I bring my own. And I looked at her and I thought, yep, you're right. And there was a perspective of the social model of disability, wasn't there? I thought that was really super powerful. I think I probably, how much time have I got, Milo? I have not been keeping track. I'm being a very bad speaker. Uh, only a few minutes, but uh, we're loving what you're sharing, so. Um... All right, I'll, I'll keep going, but I'll try and make it a bit quicker, less of the stories. Um, inclusion, a full life is a big life, is a whole life. Here is my kids, I took them cuttlefish snorkeling. Who would have thought in, I don't know, minus X degrees water, it was freezing and horrible, but it was incredible to see it. I never, ever would have believed that I would have been able to take Ben on that, but we gave it a go and he did it. And it was an incredibly amazing experience. General advice, uh, I wish someone had told me that I can't do this alone. I have always tried to do this alone until very, very recently. Um, I think sometimes I can steer that boat. Sometimes I can row that boat, but it's very rare that I can do both. And it's very rare that I can do both at the same time. So you need other people to help you row that boat, help you keep afloat, help you steer that boat, listen to others, take the advice and support that you can. You'll be surprised. Fit your own oxygen mask first. They're kind of cliches, but do you know what? They're good. They're real. Um, this one's a really big one. Now, this one's a little bit controversial. And this is that I think that people, uh, families with kids with disabilities should keep their feet in two worlds, the disability world and the full inclusive mainstream world. My son went to Scouts. He went to regular inclusive school all the way through, but he was also involved in Special Olympics and other places where he could make networks and friends of his own that had a similar um, intellectual disabilities to him because his best friends now his best, closest friends, the ones that he can still have fart jokes with at the age of 21, are those people with intellectual disability. Although I'm sure, Mello, you still do fart jokes, right? Yeah, there you go. Got it. Um, so uh, the benefits of, of the getting that network with other families with disability are huge. Peer support is so important. That venting, that capacity to understand that all parenting is a roller coaster, right? We have ups and downs. For us as parents of people with disability, the highs are way higher. It's super exciting when our kids achieve, but the lows are also an awful lot lower for us. So I think to be able to share that with other people who get it, you, you, can't, you can't beat that. You can't beat that. So keeping your feet in both worlds, most of you wouldn't be able to tell me which of those people are disabled and which aren't. Um, some of them are and some of them aren't. This is at Ben's 18th birthday party, some of his friends. Um, something that I found really valuable when Ben was little was that I made friends with the other regular parents at the school because they were the ones that had more availability to help me out. Well, that's not why. I shouldn't say because. But I did find out that they were the ones that were more available to help me in a crunch because the other families with kids with disability were dealing with all their own rubbish at the time as well which is what, which what happens to us. Okay, we, we, we have tough times and good times. I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there, Mello. A couple more minutes. All right. I wish someone had told me, I wish, I wish, what would Ben be doing if he didn't have disability? If he took the disability away, what would be happening in his life right now? And I, I do this when I work with families now as, as, a, as a peer supporter. I say, what career would they have? And people with you know parents look at me with blank faces and say what do you mean what career they're in a wheelchair and they can't talk and they can't eat what do you mean what would they have see no 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 if they could do any career this is your kid and what you know about their personality who would they be what would they be doing because once you have an idea of that you can break it back down to the little things that get you super close what who would ben be if he didn't have a disability uh he would be a rap artist and a rock star he would be a, an international athlete. Hang on, hang on. And now I have to think, actually, they're the things he is doing. Now, he's doing them at a different level and potentially at a different audience at times, but he is actually doing this stuff. Like, it blows my mind. Who would have thought? Look at this guy. Doesn't he look professional and amazing? Like, it freaks me out. 
Am I saying we don't have challenges? Am I saying that I don't want to throw them in a rubbish bin uh, often? No, I'm not saying that. I do, I do, I do. And he knows that. Same here. He's ready to move out. We're working on it, trust me. All right. Sometimes things go pear-shaped. Um, we've all seen it. We've all had it happen. Everything falls apart. Providers are terrible. Uh, your kid is sick. Someone says something mean. I'll never forget the day Ben came home from school and he said, Mum, I got a new name. I said, what's that? He said, I, the retard. And clearly, clearly kids at school had, had said these horrible things to him. And did I fall in a hole? Yeah. Did I go and buy my first big screen TV that week and hide in front of it for weeks? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you've got to pull a face, you've got to vent, you've got to cry, and then you've got to move on. And your peers can help you do that. Sometimes, however, that's not good enough. Sometimes you've got to pull out a sledgehammer. Just so you know, this photo is not my kid destroying a car at home or at a farm, right? This is at Scouts. This is at Jamboree. He went up to Jamboree for 10 days um, years ago. And they had this awesome thing where they had these bunch of old cars and all the kids got sledgehammers and they got to just smash up cars. So, wow, I wish I could go smash up cars. It'd be awesome. Sometimes you need a sledgehammer and sometimes you're going to need to fight things. You're going to need to take it to AAT, to the Human Rights Commission, to the boss of the company that's providing your service, your local MP, wherever it is. Sometimes you're going to have to do that, but pick and choose it because you've only got so many spoons in your life can't do everything and last but not least um let your kid be a kid don't fill them with therapy don't fill them with disability and disability and disabled lives um let them be a kid because they're going to grow up and they're going to become an adult um and they're not um they're going to want independence your child even at the age of 10 they are not like a three-year-old and we should never be using that word. We should never be infantilizing our kids. Our kids grow up and they will have the bodies and lives of adults if we allow them to have the bodies and lives of adults. So please think about your kid having a girlfriend in the future or a boyfriend or a partner. Think about them moving out of home. As much as you want to shelter them and cocoon them, look to that independent life. Um, I think that's super important. I wish... I had heard all of this and listened to this and acted on all this when my boys were younger. I'm still learning now. People like Glenda in my life are super important. Um, I think that's all I've got to say, Mello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I wish all of you a full, rich, inclusive life for yourselves and your families. And yes, there's going to be troughs. You're going to feel like rubbish sometimes. Um, but Overwhelmingly, parenting is that journey, uh, regardless of disability. Um, I wish you all my love and success in the future for everyone. Thank you.